makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Central bankers are warning the monetary policy outlook remains uncertain despite growing expectations of peak rates. We'll discuss the possible credit risk facing banks with the president of the Institute for International Finance. Also on the show, will U.S. debt watchers see the pathway clearing for a real revival in the world's biggest bond market? We're joined by J.P. Morgan's global head of debt capital. Capital Markets' Kevin Foley, plus a third exclusive this hour on one of the biggest corporate stories of the year. The Telecom Italia chief executive joins us to discuss his blockbuster deal with KKR worth as much as 22 billion euros. So first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. This is what the European markets map are telling us. Now, a lot of the focus, of course, is on dollar. Dollar headed for the steepest monthly drop in a year. Uh, Treasury is pretty much steady. Remember, this has a lot to do with what the Fed is doing. And there's a bet out there on the market, very clear, that actually the Fed is almost done with interest rate hiking cycles. There was a bit of a pushback from Dave Ramsman of the BOE, but there is a feeling also in Europe that they're now done. Whether we see rate cuts or not, speaking to a lot of central bankers and on and off the record, they really want to push back against that narrative simply because it's not useful. It makes uh, their transmission mechanism that much harder and it doesn't keep a lot of the meetings kind of what they call alive. Now, this is probably the most interesting start, uh, chart of the day, if not um, of the month. The rate cut bets have definitely surged in terms of what the Fed could do in terms of uh, actually cutting rates. So we're seeing a September 2024 call, seeing a large open interest rates at 97 and 98. It basically just shows that there are more and more people in the markets now expecting a rate cut when it comes to the second half of next year. Again, dollar falling for a fourth day as it's facing its worth or worse monthly decline in a year. The greenback strength is losing steam again as traders turn more optimistic about the likelihood of Fed rate cuts. Now, for more on all of this and the wider markets, Hannah Smith, Vice President for ETFs of State Street, now joins us. Hannah, as always, so good to have you on the program. People believe there's cuts, that there's a lot of cuts coming, and actually there's not going to more any interest rate hikes. Do you agree? Uh, I think if you look at the market, it seems that it's actually got carried away with this narrative. If we look at the performance, the topics being at 33-year highs and the S&P nearly at its uh, highest uh, peak in some time, I think that um, looking at the data that's supportive of this, for example, the, the payrolls, which really drove um, uh, the market performance, it doesn't feel that that is enough to warrant um, what we've seen in the market so far. So I think if you look at investors and, and where they've been allocating, they're not entirely con convinced with this narrative. But Anna, have we seen this in the past? It feels like every like three, four months, there's a conviction in the markets and then central banks kind of had to walk it down and say, look, we don't know exactly what kind of economy we'll be left with. So w what are the signs that you're looking for to, to, you know, to price in rate cuts? Yeah, definitely. I think, as you mentioned, we, we have seen this before, and the market does get carried away with itself sometimes. And I think that we need to see more consistent data. Um, the payrolls was a modest downside surprise after a number of um, quite modest upside surprises. So I think we need to see consistently lower inflation numbers. Uh, we need to see um, uh, some of the data that's, that's going to be coming out this week, the US, Europe, um, we need to see positive trends in terms of inflation and where that's going. Um, I know yesterday as well with some of the new home sales, they're a little bit disappointing. So I think we're seeing mixed data at the moment and we need to see more of a consistent pattern to be confident that we're going to be getting cuts as the market expects next year. So Hannah, do you think, again, and the market, it's interesting to look at market psychology. Is it because they think that basically the hiking that we've had so far is starting to, to hurt the economy and so the economy takes a downturn or, or are they just going on the data that they're seeing so far? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that the, the market, um, good news is, it, the bad news is good news at the moment. So whether there, whenever there's a sign of um, inflation coming down and, and also some weakening in the economies, um, yeah. that's when the market seems to, seems to be rallying. And, and what we saw is some of the weaker data came out of the U.S. with the non-farm payrolls, and it was actually the U.S. stock market that benefited the most from that. So it's very mixed at the moment, and I think what the 
market really is looking for is some sign that we have now that the, that the Fed has done enough, that the central banks have, have done enough, and that's what it's, what it's holding on for. So, Hannah, what does it mean for, you know, what kind of flows you're seeing for ETFs and what people should buy? Yes, definitely. So I think what, what we've seen and, and what I alluded to earlier is that a lot of the flows into equities have actually been in defensive sectors. Mm -hmm. So whilst there is this risk on tone or what it appears to be in the market, if you look under the hood, what you're seeing is a lot of the flows have been into those more defensive sectors like consumer staples, healthcare, um, and so on and so forth. We also seen flows into technology. Technology's had a very good run when we saw the Q3 earnings. Um, they 81% of companies um, outperform versus expectations. So that's warranted. But I think for some of the more cyclical sectors, energy, industrials, we're not necessarily seeing flows there. And I think investors should be cautious um, because, we, as I mentioned, we still haven't seen this uh, con uh, consistent data, which gives us conviction in going back into the more cyclical assets. And how much of a difference is there with, I guess, the landscape picture that we're seeing in Europe or the UK compared to the US? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, in regards to what we're seeing in the markets, the US, um, we're very positive on the US. Um, I think at the moment, given the volatility that we've seen in the data, I think it makes sense to be in large caps and be um, in areas where we've seen profitability. And the US definitely is consistent with that. Um, the Europe is a little bit more fragile. And I think that the European equities actually have high exposure to cyclical assets. So we'd actually warrant some caution when allocating there. The UK is a little bit different. It has high defensive allocation. There's also a very strong free, uh, high free cash flow within those companies, um, which alludes to stronger dividends. So the UK, um, whilst the economy is still quite fragile, it's a, it's a good bet from an investment perspective. But, but it looks expensive. I know you've seen flows actually, for example, in some of the U.S. large caps, especially IT. Yes. Yeah, it is expensive. Um, uh, but I think that in, in some instances it's warranted. If we're worried about some of the recessionary concerns, then I think IT, as we saw in the earnings um, in Q3, it, it warrants, um, it, it is expensive, um, but there's still room for it to, to go further. Um, but I think that having, having a mix of some of the more defensive asset classes as well uh, within equities, U.S. equities, um, would be helpful. Helpful. So healthcare, for example, and consumer staples. Um, Anna, when you look at the UK, I know you're, you're recommending actually buying things in the UK. Is that because it looks cheap or because you, it, does it look cheap and you see growth value or is it just because, relative to everything else? It's relative to everything else. So within the UK, um, I think at the moment it warrants caution when investing. Yeah. And um, because we are still unsure as to uh, when we're expecting to see cuts, I think it's, it makes sense to be quite defensive. And the UK is well known for having high exposure to defensive. Um, healthcare, consumer staples, um, and so on. And so I think when investors are looking to allocate to equities, we actually prefer fixed income, but if they do want to allocate to equities, then looking at those areas where there is a higher exposure to defensive makes sense, and the UK is one of those that stands out. Is there anything else? I mean, if you look at also the exposure to energy, but also healthcare, do, do you see attractive values in certain healthcare companies, or it's just a little bit too choppy at the moment? I think healthcare, it's, it's quite, I think, a, a broad exposure to healthcare. I think that it's, um, it's, it's actually still quite under-owned, so there's still opportunity uh, within the asset class, um, and the valuations are, are attractive as well. So I think, in general, having a broad allocation to healthcare makes sense at the moment. Um, Hannah, what do you do with a lot of the currencies? So, you know, dollar kind of dominates everything. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the moves that they've had this week. Does that continue into the new year? Yeah, I think, I think so. Actually, if you look at dollar, it was up um, between July and October 7%. Um, and now, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's looking at its uh, biggest monthly decline. Um, if you add into that seasonality, the dollar tends to underperform in December. Over the last 10 years, there's only been two years, 2014 and 2016, where it actually outperformed. In, in general, it tends to um, uh, underperform by about 1%. So I think that that combines with um, how the market's reacting in terms of expecting cuts coming soon. The dollar isn't looking uh, very attractive right now. We should probably mention Japan as well because we haven't done so for at least two weeks or even like one week. What do you do with Japan, Anna? Uh, Japan is an interesting one. I think it's the performance has obviously been phenomenal year to date but if we look at some of the factors that were driving that, Japan is really dependent on uh, uh, positive business cycles mm -hmm. and as we start to see um, more restrictive um, monetary policy, I think that Japan is likely to take a back seat. Um, I think that the yen as well, um, if we're looking at the yen and as it starts to strengthen, that's actually negative for the companies within within the topic. So whilst Japan has done very well, we're starting to see outflows, and I think that you need to be a bit more cautious when it comes to Japan. Uh, Hannah, it's the first time we're also getting Olaf Scholz, of course, the Chancellor in Germany, the first time that I hear him directly talk about this budget ruling. He says it makes it much harder to achieve some of the key goals. Is, is that a concern? Do you look at Germany as, a, as you know, a, a play, a value play as a country, just to look at it in, in the 
wider European context? We tend to look at within the wider European context that a lot of the allocations at the moment are broadly to Europe and obviously the, the, the intricacies of Germany impact Europe substantially as a whole. So I think when we're looking at Europe in general, um, we, do, we don't think that it's a, a very attractive place to be right now from, a, from an equity market perspective. Um, and, and obviously, whilst we do expect that um, we're reaching peak rates and that uh, the market's actually looking to pricing cuts, I think, as early as April next year, I think that there definitely needs to be some caution um, on the region as a whole. Hannah, thank you so much. Hannah Smith there, Vice President for ETFs at State Street. Now, we were also getting uh, lines, actually, from Olaf Scholz. A reminder, the German Chancellor's government did approve a supplementary 2023 budget that includes, for example, the suspension of rules limiting net new borrowing for a fourth consecutive year. So this is after a constitutional court ruling a couple of weeks ago that people are still trying to figure out the longer-term effects of. Coming up, central banks around the world are sounding the alarm for future policy outlook as rates remain high. We'll speak exclusively to the president and chief executive of the IIF. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, central bankers from the UK, Australia, and Thailand have warned that monetary policy outlook remains uncertain despite growing global expectations that rates are at or near their peak. Now, speaking at a monetary conference in Hong Kong, the governor of the Bank of Spain says there are, quote, sending the message that the banking sector should remain very prudent. Well, my next guest says banks are well prepared for a bumpy ride. Here with me, the Institute of International Finance President and Chief Executive Officer Tim Adams. Thank you for joining us, Tim. As always, give us a sense of where banks are right now. So there's, you know, we'll get onto some of the higher capital requirements. We'll talk about Basel III sure. and, and some of the unknowns. But overall, what are you expecting central banks to do? Well, first of all, Francine, thanks for having me back. It's always great to see you. It's great to be here. Look, we expect rates probably have capped out, but they're going to stay high for a long time. This expectation that rates are going to turn and we're going to have rate cuts in the near term, I think is kind of fanciful thinking. We're all uh, buried in and ready for long-term uh, long rates for, for quite a while. So one of the most interesting things, you know, that um, you, you and your team are working on is, of course, you've previously described some of these mooted higher capital requirements on U.S. lenders as puzzling as counterproductive. I mean, banks seem to be at loggerhead with the Fed. How do you think it gets resolved? Yeah, well, uh, we've had a lot of capital. We've added trillions since the great financial crisis, trillions in liquidity. We've reduced the leverage. We need to focus on profitability. We need to yeah. focus on supporting economic growth. The, the world needs uh, uh, economic growth. The advanced economies need ec economic growth. We need to focus on how to get more growth. Do, do you, how do you see this playing out? Do you see actually a lot of the banks retrenching? Are they lending less? Uh, they will, and uh, most certainly with these kind of capital requirements. And we're already seeing a lot of debanking. We see risk moving off our balance sheet into private equity, private capital. So the world of finance is changing. New intermediaries are rising, and that, that poses new risk for, for uh, regulators. So because they because regulators aren't quite understanding what they need to do to get to get a better outcome or what do you think the root of the problem is? Well, uh, new players that just don't fall in the, the ordinary right. regulatory infrastructure. Shadow banking. Of course. Uh, so we hear it from a lot of regulators. They're looking at non-bank financial intermediaries, yeah. but they don't really have the institutional framework to look at them yeah. in depth. I think that will change over time, but not immediately. But so what do you, do you think? Do, do you worry about crypto exchanges, or is that even in a separate category? Well, we, well, Difficult are, not are to left? at this point. So, yeah, yeah there have been a problem, and, and that's obviously been an issue that's been pointed out for some time. I think crypto has probably peaked in terms of currencies, but I do think stable coins, uh, if properly constructed, are still are going to be around for a while. Tim, do you have any insight into how much less lending they're doing because of these capital requirements? And again, how much of, I guess, a dent this would have on profitability? Yeah, I don't have a, a, a figure on how much. We do, we do know there's a lot of debanking going on. And a lot of this uh, regulation, especially in the U.S., is prescriptive. But I do think we'll see banks' balance sheets shrink because of it and uh, lending moving to other places. We need lending for growth, and we need growth going mm -hmm. forward. Is it, I mean, when you talk about, you know, talk about Basel III, and please, viewers, like, stick with us, because this is really extremely important. We talk about Basel III, we talk about insolvency. Is there anyone that you speak to that, that has a blueprint that would, I guess, keep the banks fair and safe, but, but, but you know, do it more cleverly? Well, some of the issue for Basel III is 
operational risk and how do we think about cyber resiliency, which is a huge, huge issue? How do we think about technology spend and AI, which is, you know, in every board uh, uh, meeting uh, in, among our member firms? So it's really dissecting where are the risks and how do we appropriately put capital in response to that risk? Yeah. How do you look at AI and actually the flows in banks? It's, it's a tough, it's a tough one, isn't it? Well, we're spending billions, tens of billions, and will for decades to come. We're all going to deploy it. We're all thinking uh, that we need some signal from the public sector in terms of where are the guardrails. We want to innovate, but we also need some sense from the public sector. Where are they going with respect to, to safety and soundness? But it, does the, our interaction also with mobile apps, does it actually change our interaction with banks? I know, and I don't want to talk about, you know, a collapse of a bank in particular, but do, do, do we need to reframe actually how we look at banking and our relations to them? Oh, of course, the, the relationship we have with our uh, smartphones, with apps, have changed the way we do all right. transactions, the way we consume. And that, uh, that's also for banking as well. So, yes. But so does bank, if, so do, do bankers, and again, I think of SVB, I could think of many others, do banks now need to think of having a different deposit base because there's this larger risk of, of people actually than, you know, getting out flows? Well, I think SVB was an idiosyncratic uh, institution, but I do think policymakers are looking at how is technology and social media changing the way that we think about mm -hmm. risks to a run to a financial institution. Tim, outside Basel III, what are the areas of finance you worry about? Oh, well, uh, we're looking at sustainability and our role in terms of COP is starting. So our, our role in intermediating the trillions that are needed for transition around the world. Well, debt levels around the world have increased 60 trillion uh, in five years. Huge levels of debt in terms of just nominal and uh, in terms of size of GDP. So lots of things to worry about out there. How much do your members actually think about M&A and whether, you know, A, it will happen cross-border in Europe and elsewhere and whether they can be part of you know, the, the acquiree or the acquirer? Yeah, we need uh, consolidation. We need consolidation in the U.S. We need consolidation in Europe. We need cross-border. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Policymakers need to signal that not only will they allow it to happen, they want it to happen. Until that, until that occurs, I think we are stuck with the infrastructure we have. Tim, as always, thank you so much for joining us. That was Tim Adams, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for International Finance. I also have to say, you put on a great show. Oh. Let me tell you, every time you have like uh, some of these summits around the world, it's always interesting and, and well put together. Up next, the truce between Israel and Hamas is extended. We'll have the details just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Israel and Hamas have agreed to extend a pause in fighting for two more days. Now, the halt was originally due to end today, but will now last until Thursday morning local time. It's hoped that the extension will actually lead to further exchanges of hostages held by Hamas and Palestinians detained in Israel and allow for more aid to reach Gaza. Now, let's get more on this with Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. So, Ros, uh, thank you, as always, for joining us. What has driven, actually, this extended truce? Well, certainly there's been pressure on both Israel and Hamas to extend the truce from the U.S., from many other countries concerned about the humanitarian situation inside Gaza, and also the priority to get these hostages back out of, uh, of Gaza as soon as possible. And so very much a concerted effort on that front. And what we did see is the truce actually held for those four days, and prisoners uh, were, in fact, uh, exchanged you know, from, from Israel back to Gaza and, of course, the hostages back to Israel. So it does seem to have had some success. The idea is, like, let's give it a bit more air to breathe. Two more days can mean some more hostages can come out, some more aid can go in. Everybody gets a chance to collect themselves, including the civilians inside Gaza. But also it can give Hamas a chance to regroup itself, potentially, and same with the Israeli forces. So it was probably seen as a benefit, really, for, for both sides to be doing this. So how bad is the current humanitarian situation? Well, we know it's, it remains very difficult, even with that aid going in. Of course, we're talking about medicine and so on coming into the people of Gaza, but a large parts of Gaza are still cut off. And if the aid comes in through these trucks, through the Rafah crossing, which is at the bottom near Egypt, uh, that traveling up to the northern parts of Gaza is pretty much impossible because Israel is really saying we don't want anything going into the northern areas of Gaza itself. So we know the humanitarian situation remains very dire. We know the Hamas that says 14,000 people have died inside Gaza since this conflict broke out and that the death rate continues even if the fighting has paused for now. People have been trapped obviously under rubble, people are in hospitals without uh, medicine and so on. So we know it remains very, very, very difficult 
Indeed. Is there a possibility that, that, I guess, the truce gets extended? Anthony Blinken is also going for the third time since the attacks on October 7th. Well, it's interesting to see he's making yet another trip to the region in between a NATO ministerial and then obviously going on to the COP meeting uh, on climate change. But um, he's been there three times now, I think, since the war broke out and very, very busy uh, talking to all the parties involved. Uh, but certainly the truce has made sense uh, for four days, perhaps for six. But the comments from the Israeli prime minister have been very, very clear. He doesn't think this is accomplished. He thinks there's a lot more to do. He says his ultimate goal is to eradicate Hamas. And that's not been achieved so far. And he's just said that from the outset. At whatever point this truce, which he won't call a ceasefire, uh, ends, the fighting will resume. Ros, thank you for the update. Ros and Matheson, they're Bloomberg's EMEA news director. Now, coming up, we speak actually about telecoms, our exclusive interview with Pietro Labriola, the chief executive of Teleco Italia. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. The U.S. dollar falls for a fourth day, heading for its worst month in a year. Also on the show, U.S. debt watchers see the pathway clearing for a real revival in the world's biggest bond market. We're joined by J.P. Morgan's global head of debt capital markets, Kevin Foley. Plus, a third exclusive this hour, one of the biggest corporate stories of the year. The Telecom Italia chief executive joins us to discuss its blockbuster deal with KKR worth as much as 22 billion euros. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Telecom Italia has agreed to sell its landline network to private equity giant KKR for as much as 22 billion euros earlier this month. The agreement, which is backed by the Italian government, should allow Telecom Italia to reduce its debt by 14 billion euros. Its biggest shareholder, Vivendi, opposes the deal and says it will use all legal avenues to challenge the decision. Well, joining us now is Telecom Italia's chief executive, he's Pietro Labriola. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Labriola. Great to see you in London after also the announcement of, of such a huge deal. What's the rationale behind the deal? Are you happy with the way it's proceeded and that you're doing it for the right things? No, sure. I'm very happy also because this is not something that we did in an hidden way. It's important to remember that our company has 20 billion euro debt. It is something that in a such period of time as the one we are today, it's very complex. In July of the last year, 2022, we presented a plan in which what we were proposing was to sell the network, yep. to have the possibility to deleverage the company and give to what remains of the company the opportunity to have again uh, industrial and strategic option. Yep. We did it one year ago, July 2022, and we exactly implemented what we told. And today we are giving the opportunity to what remain after the sale of the, netco, of the network, opportunity. This, in a nutshell, yeah. the, mes, the most important thing. But so, again, apart from actually getting down the debt, was there another rationale of, of selling this part to KKR? Or is it just so that, as you very well explained, because you're a straight shooter, getting rid of that and then growing Telecom Italia without the network? Yes, also because there's a trend through all the world. Infrastructure, now we are in front of a new wave of huge investment for, for the infrastructure. This huge investment, it's much easier yeah. to be managed when you take that private. Yeah. But another important thing that we are in front of a new challenge for all the players. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary that you own and you keep the property of all the assets that you manage to offer telco services. Just to give you an idea. This is exactly what's happened to all the mobile players when they sold the towers, the antennas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you stop to be a telco player. You are doing some choices that is a make or by choice. But when you look at Service Co., which is basically Telecom Italia without the network, can it survive on its own? What are your plans there? The question is really interesting because there's a lot of confusion of Service Co. Service Co. is not the consumer. Service Co. is a kind of holding that we own. Yeah. Three different business, 
Brazil, let's remember that we yeah. control 67% of Team Brazil, that is one of the most profitable mobile players yeah. in the world, we will double the dividend. Then, and Brazil worth more or less 45% of the ABDA mm -hmm. minus capex. And you never thought of selling that? No. You never thought of touching Brazil? Can you ask to Deutsche Telekom to sell T-Mobile? 75% <laughs> of the ABDA of Deutsche Telekom is coming from outside. So that stays? Yeah. When we talk about the domestic part, you can divide it by two. On one side, what we call enterprise co. Mm -hmm. Is the telco player that will sell and offer connectivity, cloud and cybersecurity to the large enterprises of the country and to the public administration. We won the bid to offer cloud to the public administration yeah. for the next 13 years, yeah. jointly with Casa de Bossi e Prestiti, Leonardo and Sergei. And this worth more or less 20, 25% of the EBD minus capex. And then we have the consumer. The consumer is for sure the toughest part of this um, holding or portfolio of activity. But this is not uh, an Italian case, it's an European case. Please confirm it. You can confirm it. Do you know any European country where uh, manage the consumer telco business is profitable today? It's quite complex. Everybody are talking about the need for a market consolidation through all Europe. And so consumer yeah. is for sure the toughest part we have to manage. But it's a portfolio of well-weighted and equilibrated businesses. Peter, what's your relationship like with Vivendi at the moment? Can you, can you convince them not to take legal action? I'm, I'm continuing to tell to everybody that in this moment of the company, more than ever, it's important the dialogue between all the stakeholders, yeah. not only shareholders. I'm always disposed with Vivendi and I've always been in touch with Vivendi, try to understand always if there is an alternative mm -hmm to our plan. I don't think to be the most clever guy of the world. So if there's someone with a better idea, I was always been ready to follow that. But in the last couple of years, we have dismantled and yeah. rebuilt the company yeah. several times to try to understand what, which could be the better combination for the future. But are they softening? Are they softening or do you think they'll still go f full legal suit? I don't know, but again, this is in the in the hands. But what is important to remember that Vivendi was in the board in July 2022 when we approved mm -hmm. this plan. So perhaps something has changed, but again, I don't see any alternative plan for the company. So when do you think the sale, or how confident are you that the sale of Netco will happen in, in the first half of next year? I'm very confident it will happen in the first half of next year. Then before the summer, to be clear, because if not, uh, someone can say 30 of June. By the summer, it will happen. And, and what will happen to the consumer unit? So if you lay out for me, is there, is there going to be an M&A in the consumer unit? Is that something that This is something see? that we have to keep on the radar. But what is important is that it's not necessarily a traditional M&A. What's happened? I have to manage the top line yeah. and the cost base. Top line is difficult to grow because this is not a market that will have further new customer. The only possibility to grow is ARPU increase, no. price increase, but it's, there, it's very difficult in this environment. So you have to optimize the cost base. A way to optimize the cost base is to create a unique network. No. Sometimes put together the frequencies of two players, yeah. have a unique 5G network. This is something you have to think about. But so are you telling me that you could also be a seller? Or in, in the space, or you, or you want to be a, a buyer? When you talk about I want about to be a buyer, but, but we, are, we are not on sale. We, have, we sold the network to give a new industrial strategic opportunity to what remains. Mm -hmm. And with the level of leverage that we have, we have the possibility to invest for the growth of the company. Can you also update us on the single network? So is it likely or not to happen, this you know, uh, merger between Telecom Italia network and the open fiber? I'm quite sure that it will happen, but it's not on my responsibility. But I think that also the Italian government was very vocal, saying that they would like to have a unique grid in Italy. Yeah. So I think that this is something that will happen. It makes a lot of sense. It makes no sense to build two complete separate FTTH networks. There's no return on investment.
And and this will can how quickly can this happen? And again, I mean, you love telecoms. I've spoken yeah, to you yeah, many I'm times. I mean, this it. is like your passion to understand where you see Europe going and the place of Italy in it. What would I, be the biggest change in the next five years in how these are operated and put together? I think that first of all, we'll have one FTTH network, and it will have also a more rational return on investment. We have to continue to attract inv attract investment from abroad. If you have no return on investment, if you look at Macquarie and KKR, which is the advertising campaign that we are doing to our country, if they will have no return on investment on infrastructure. So this is really important. And then I don't think that it's only a matter of Italy, but in Europe. We talk about digitalization of Europe. Without infrastructure, we'll have no digitalization. And to have infrastructure, we have to guarantee the right investment. We are too many. Too many players in Europe, more than 100 players. Makes no sense. Mm -hmm. If I may, look at Brazil. They were in late compared to all the yeah. other countries in the investment on 5G. They moved from five to three player. The return on investment come back, and now what is happening, they are investing much more in deployment of the 5G network. And today Brazil but, has one of the widest 5G networks. But is it realistic that Europe can take Brazil as a template? There needs to be also political will. Right, and money yes. spent and investment. Yes, I think that uh, we have to understand that we have no future if we think that we continue in that way. Okay. US, three player. Brazil, three player. China, three player. Europe, more than 100. <laughs> I think that's quite difficult. How do you see the future of Telecom Italia as a listed company or as a private company? As a listed company. I think For that sure. There's no benefits in taking it private and running it differently? Usually, you take private when you have to sustain a period of peak funding in terms of investment. This is more, more, more the case of the network, because they have to face in the next five, six years a level of investment of 1.5 billion, 2 billion per year. It's completely different. We want to keep team listed. Then again, let's see what will happen and how we can improve our number. Pietro. Thank you for joining us. My I hope it's the first of many interviews when you come to London. Pietro Labriola, they're the chief executive of Telecom Italia. Now, coming up, we hear from Dave Ramsden, the deputy Bank of England governor on the UK Central Bank economic outlook for next year. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. What we've seen so far this year in terms of growth is actually more resilience than we were expecting. So there was positive growth in the first half of the year, but we've seen zero, uh, a zero uh, print for growth in Q3. And our forecast is that growth is going to continue to flatline as um, restrictive monetary policy continues to bear down on demand. Well, that was Dave Ramsden, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, speaking to Anna Edwards a little bit earlier on. Now, the world's biggest bond market has clawed its way back after spending chunks of 2023 underwater. Now, many U.S. debt watchers see the pathway clearing for a real revival. Now, the Bloomberg U.S. Treasury Index recently shifted to a positive return for the year as signs of a slowing inflation and measured jobs growth unleashed a rally that's actually sent yields tumbling from their highest in more than a decade. Well, to discuss all of this, we're joined by Kevin Foley, a global head of debt capital markets at J.P. Morgan. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. You're actually in one of the most exciting spaces uh, in the markets right now. Like, how do you see debt capital markets developing? They, they've, I mean, the market is unsure about what the Fed does and their pricing and cuts. Do you worry about something ugly happening? Well, first, good morning and thank you for having me. I think uh, as a credit person, I always worry. Uh, so it's, <laughs> is it's, that part of the job description? That's part of the job description. <laughs> Uh, but I think as you, yeah, you have concerns around here. We've had a robust rally here in the past five to six weeks. It's been a significant within the high yield market. You've seen a 75 basis points of tightening on a spread basis. You have seen Treasury rates come down. I think probably some of the concern is, are we truly out of the woods? Right. You still got geopolitical yeah. concerns. We've still got inflation hanging in the balance while it looks better. The, the consumer continues to spend, but the, can they sustain that? 
yeah. employment picture remains strong, but can that be sustained? There's a lot still to work itself through the economy, and there's always the un known unknowns that we don't know, and you worry about whether that's another regional bank crisis or something like that. So while we're optimistic and we feel good about going into the next year, and we've been uh, positively surprised by the resiliency of the economy, we still have room for caution. So this is what I find incredible, that actually despite, and I speak to chief executives on, on a daily basis and say, look, the economy, the figures, the data points are all very positive. But mathematically, I just don't see how that's possible longer term if you go from, like, let's say, 1% interest rates to 5%. Yep. Is that fair? No, it's fair. And I think what we, we still, I think you have to look at it from a standpoint of inter higher interest rates are still working its way through the system. Right. Right. We have been in an environment where... There's been on the greatest refinancing wave in history. A lot of maturities were pushed out. That's part of the technical picture that's helping the debt markets right now because you've got limited issuance, still a lot of cash out there in the system. But we will see issuance needs pick up over time, right. and that's going to come at higher rates. Now, we think corporate balance sheets are healthy and are set up to absorb some of that. But it's still going to have to take a fair amount of navigating. We did two charts for you, the Foley charts. I mean, they're wonderful because one looks at investment grade and the other one's high yield. I mean, where do you see actually, if you look at high yield, do you see opportunities? Well, I think you first take it from a standpoint of an issuer perspective. You are right now at a, on a spread basis, 500 basis points inside the recessionary average for that index. Um, you're still 75 basis points inside the average for non-recessionary. So while rates have gone up and overall yields and cost of capital have gone up, on a spread basis, it's still really attractive. So you have to Is that, that right, mind. though? Is it right, the way it's behaving? Or is there something that, that you think is odd in the way that... This, is what, this <laughs> is what we knew earlier in my career, right? This is the new normal. Um, this is normalization. It's not... You look at... You know, there's a lot of debate, what's normal, what's abnormal... A lot would say over the past 10 years, having ultra low interest rates was more abnormal normal period. And we're getting back to normalization, which is interest rates where they are and spreads where they are. Okay, I guess the question is, when you speak to central bankers, they're trying to get through the message to markets that it's higher for longer. Yep. And markets just are pricing in cuts and cuts and more cuts. What does that mean, again, for, for your world and your space and how the debt capital markets will behave? I think that's where, to your earlier question of where there's a potential for volatility. Right. The market is pricing in rate cuts, in, in particular in the back half of next year. That's going to be, that's assuming the market, the, the central bankers have the luxury of doing that, of inflation under control. Mm -hmm. It also, you have to look at the flip side of that and say, well, if they're cutting rates, that might mean a weaker economic environment. So does that mean spreads in our markets gap out? Yeah. And it goes back to those recessionary average. So what we're having the debate with issuers of, here do you wait? So, yeah, rates may come down, but you might see spreads gap out because we're in a weaker economic picture. So how do you, you know, you've got to factor it all in. So, Kevin, when you look at outlook for 2024, when you look at investment grade markets or even leveraged finance, what do you find most interesting? Where do you think, you know, without using the word sparks will fly, certainly what we should be watching out for? Well, I think first, from an issuance standpoint, we expect investment grade is going to be flattish year over year. Um, high yield market, we expect up around 40% year over year. The lo leveraged loan market up about 20% from a pure issuance standpoint. Um, it is what we've been talking about. We, whether inflation remains under control, the economy remains resilient, is that what's that going to give the central banks uh, flexibility to do what they need to do? Geopolitical concerns are still out there. So there's a lot of things hanging in the balance. It's more of the same in terms of the issues that we're discussing. And then I think, like I always like to note, is the known unknowns that there is gonna, there's always a chance for surprises out there. Yeah, there certainly is. Kevin, thank you so much for joining Great. us today. Thank you. Kevin Foley there, Global Head of Debt Capital Markets at J.P. Morgan. Now, coming up, we hear from the EU's climate chief as he urges non-G7 nations to pay up on for losses and damages caused by extreme weather. His comments come ahead of COP28 talks that start this week. So we'll have plenty more on that next. And this is Bloomberg.
Well, the European Union's climate chief, Upke Hoekstras, says that countries outside the G7 need to pay up for loss and damages caused by extreme weather. His comments highlight what is said to be a major hurdle with China and Saudi Arabia during COP28 talks starting this week. You know, there, there are two things that are very important here. One is uh, making sure that the world shows that there is a commitment, mm -hmm. not only in words, but also in deeds. And the reality is that the whole uh, climate action transition needs to have much more funding, uh, private and public. That is one. The second thing is that we also need to move beyond always the usual suspects paying. Uh, this, this, this really is a... a is a crisis so large mm -hmm. that everyone with the ability to chip in and to pay to rise to the occasion and, and share responsibility. So that means what world countries do you have in mind? Is that India, is that China? There has been a number of times where they pulled back uh, last minute you and know, it was disappointing. You know, again, and, and it, it, my experience in diplomacy is it is only half helpful when you, when you continuously single out mm -hmm. individual countries, but we need to move beyond just the Europeans at the G7 uh, and, and let's say the usual suspects, others need to chip in in terms of responsibility. And that, that, is, that is true in the case of providing uh, the whole endeavor with money. And it is also true in terms of uh, making sure we do more mitigation, more ambition in, in phasing our fossil fuels. Because scientists actually tell us that that is the only thing that is going to help us uh, through this crisis. And, and this is your first COP and this is a relatively new portfolio for you, but you made a, a, an addition basically to get uh, this job. And when you spoke before the European Parliament and other authorities here, you did come up with a target, which again, going back to the, the numbers behind this, which was a 90% reduction in emissions by 2040. I wonder if that is a number that you still stand by. And I wonder how do you get uh, to that? I do, but we, we do have to separate. So you double down on the so, 90 percent. But, but what we do what we do need to uh, do is, is separate two things here. Mm -hmm. One is the legislative process that we have in the European Union, and where we're saying we need to come up with the 2040 targets, uh, and we only have a first communication in the next couple of months. So that is one, and that is, and, and there I want to aim for as much as possible in terms of ambition. However, the European uh, 2030 targets or 55, which we will, by the way, uh, overperform on uh, probably towards 57. Okay. That is the short-term reality. The, the, the other thing that is extremely important is that actually we only have a couple of years left in terms of peaking emissions and making sure that the world rallies around more ambition. And that is the, that is the, the, the more general message that, that the whole world has to accept, has to, to, to get their hands around on at this COP. Well, that was the EU Climate Commissioner, Vupke Hoekstra, speaking to our very own Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Now, stay with us as we'll bring you, of course, all of those lines from this year's United Nations Climate Change Conference in Dubai. COP28 begins on Thursday. We'll preview discussions on net zero progress, climate finance and more. I have to say we have some fantastic interviews, including a lot of the big banks that will speak to us then. Let's also quickly bring you up to date with one of the top red stories on the Bloomberg terminal this morning. Barclays reported to be exploring cutting ties with some of its less profitable investment banking clients as it considers options to overhaul the bank. Now, according to the FT, executives are mulling trimming clients that don't transact enough to earn a good return. The paper says that could mean ending relationships with more than 2,500 customers out of a total of 10,000. This is a picture overall for European stocks falling for a second day. U.S. futures actually pointing to a weaker open as well. Uh, there are signs that this November rally that we had that was quite strong in equities is now overstretched. We'll have plenty more on, on that throughout the day. We'll also look at potential Fed cuts. This is Bloomberg.